So, um, my background is in classical philosophy. Um, I started teaching bioethics in um, 1975. Um, there is a picture of my late husband and me hiking in the mountains of New Mexico. And it is March of 1975. I'm newly pregnant with our daughter, Robin. Um, I had just taught my first bioethics class. And my husband, Mike, has a bandage around his knee. And we thought it was simply a bad knee. We came down from that mountain, and he was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I spent my subsequent years, professional years, teaching bioethics. We lived with his deteriorating chronic illness as a family for 35 years. So during the day, I got to do whatever it was I did as ultimately an applied ethicist. And I went home, and we were faced for decades with a life of healthcare decisions. My first real exposure to protracted, difficult, at least high stakes, at least on a personal level, decision making, was when in the mid-1980s I started chairing a hospital ethics committee. And we were faced with families, patients, healthcare professionals who confronted really wrenching decisions. Um, most of us in those days were trained in pretty much classical normative philosophy. We could spot a decisional and an executional autonomy issue five miles away. And we were quite um, excited to persuade others that that distinction really mattered. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until perhaps four years into my chairing the Ethics Committee that I took a mediation course from the man who would become my professional spouse. We uh, did a lot of teaching and writing together, Mark Bennett. And it was in that mediation course that I realized for the first time why some, if not many, of our ethics consultations failed or at least fell short. The chief complaint, please come in. There's room. Sorry. You can even sit in that chair if you like. Yeah. It's a magic chair. Um, <laughs> uh, the chief complaint was that we would have crafted what we thought was a fine decision, or at least good steps <laughs> forward. But when people left the consultation, things fell apart. The decision didn't work. It was as if people had forgotten entirely what it was we had agreed that we would do. I identified in that mediation course, conflict resolution course, a glaring omission that I think applied to ethics consultation generally in those days. And that was, as classically trained philosophers, many of us were abysmally ignorant about the <clears throat> constitutive role that process plays in creating both the integrity as well as the durability of decisions. Uh, we had no idea about um, the unspoken uh, at least non-verbally communicated dimensions of process that in fact were m much more important to the people around the table than were our elegant analytical riffs that we um, <clears throat> performed on a, on a regular basis. <clears throat> So together, Mark and I um, decided that we would add to the National Ethics Consultation Project the skills, the tools 
that folks in mediation and conflict resolution practice on a daily basis. Uh, you could call it a kind of mediation and medical ethics project. And we actually came to Canada, we came to Toronto at some point. We had a, a dog and pony show. And what we did was we presented uh, very practical ways in which ethics committees uh, could make sure that they didn't unintentionally sabotage uh, their consultation processes uh, through the ignorance of what was really going on around the table. So as Mark and I were doing this together in the late 80s, early 90s, we realized that we shared a similar frustration. He was a former civil rights litigator and attorney. He had been a family therapist. He was currently working as a mediator and a, an organizational coach consultant. I was an <clears throat> ethics consultant. Our frustration was that by the time conflicts came to us, they were already well-developed, firmly rooted, and we felt as if our business was taking place pretty much in a decision-making repair shop. Um, and it was repairing decisions that because of people's um, inattention to avoidance of, perhaps even ignorance of, those steps that are necessary to craft good decisions simply were not on their radar screen. The bottom line is many of us, if not most of us, are uncomfortable with direct exchanges about things that matter deeply to us, about values, about principles, the things that really make our life important to us. And yet, the failure, as we know on a personal level as well as a professional level, the failure to have healthy conversations about what really matters lowers the bar for ethical decision making, especially when there is the ever-present pressure to make decisions quickly. We live in a time disease culture, at least in the US. You can teach me about Canada. But, you know, what day of the week do ethics crises hit? Friday. What time? Four o'clock. Four o'clock, 4.30. Absolutely. <laughs> and many times, the crises have been going on for three weeks. But at 4.30 on Friday afternoon, they must be resolved before the start of the weekend. So Mark and I decided that early intervention was the only remedy. Um, and so we turned ourselves to simply observing what we personally had experienced in the decision-making process itself. What do we observe? Given the reality of how each of us actually makes decisions, especially <laughs> where um, values collide, would it be possible to develop a simple uh, process that people making personal decisions, maybe groups making larger decisions, simple, complex, um, would there be a series of steps that could help people move through in a relatively simple, though not easy, um, journey, the goal always being to craft a high quality decision. Some of the dimensions for us of a good decision, not all, but some of the most important are, first of all, that the decision itself resolves the issue at hand. Now that seems fairly um, obvious, but many of us have been involved in decision-making situations where the outcome is elegant, but it does not address directly the problem at hand. Second, a decision 
that takes into serious consideration those who have to implement it. If any of you have been in management and management <coughs> hands down a decision and then commands you to go forth and implement it and you have no idea how a decision was made, why it was made, but you do know your role <coughs> is to absorb the slings and arrows that come back so that the original decision makers can go on and decide for another day. And also a decision that anticipates and takes responsibility for not only the benefits but the downsides of the decision. So that was essentially um, our project. Um, we started in 1995 with what is now Colorado's largest healthcare system, Center of Health. Uh, we started at the corporate and business level and we developed uh, a values-based decision-making process that the corporation agreed that it would use throughout uh, the system for decision making. Sidebar, they're Catholic and Adventist. And if you know anything about theology, you know that they don't have a lot in common. That they wanted to um, command the market share of health care for faith-based institutions in Colorado. And that was their project. So let me give you now, I'll give you just kind of a broad outline and then I'm going to sample some of the steps, some of the concepts, some of the behaviors, just to give you a flavor um, about uh, this values-based decision-making process. <laughs> Perspective, <laughs> values, dialogue, alignment, and communication. So those are three, four, five things that I will talk about. The first is, five minutes, yep. Um, the first is perspective. <coughs> One of our assumptions is that whenever we confront a decision, we do so from our own perspective, our own angle of vision. It's as if each of us is standing around a multi-story building looking down at the courtyard, which is the issue. Uh, that is simply how we empirically, initially frame the issue. So the first question is, um, what is your perspective, what is mine? I just found these quotes to anyone, they just were fun. Forgive you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so if you're standing around a, a courtyard and you want a 360 degree view of the issue, the only way you can do it is to invite people around the courtyard and especially those on the other side who are the only ones who can see your blind spot. The second is the issue of values. And I think if I were to do this over again, I would just get rid of the word values and I would use the word meaning. And one of our assumptions is we simply are meaning creating creatures. And in very simple language, how do we for ourselves and with others invite a conversation in a given situation about what matters to us. So a couple of uh, takeaways <clears throat> from this. One, one of my assumptions is every decision that we make, we do so because something matters to us. <coughs> Second, decisions are difficult not because they are good versus bad, right versus wrong but they are difficult because they feature conflicts around things that really matter to us. They are good versus good. <clears throat> the behavior 
that lets us best excavate for meaning, ours and others, is dialogue. And Martin Buber defines dialogue, dialogue as that kind of conversation in which I hold myself open to the possibility that I might be changed by what you say. The kind of conversation in which I hold myself open to the possibility that I might be changed by what you say. <clears throat> the process itself <clears throat> gathers meaning data. It invites, requires that you then prioritize not just everything that is important, but what is most important. And that on that basis, when you have decided what matters most, that your decision, in fact, aligns with what you have committed to as most important, important. Spin, obviously, is the total misalignment, perhaps nefariously um, intentional misalignment of values and <clears throat> decision. Of all the decision-making lessons that we learned, probably the dimension that leads most to decision failure is the failure to communicate. The failure to explain what, why, and what you don't like about your decision to those who have <clears throat> a right to hear. Um, businesses, corporations will tell you 90% of the time when they craft good decisions, they communicate them poorly. A good decision communicates what the decision is, who made it, the um, accountability of the actual agents who made the decision, why they did it, and specifically what they don't like. If in fact decisions feature conflicts among goods, not all goods can be honored in the ultimate decision. Every good decision has a downside. And that is simply uh, the nature of the <clears throat> decision making. Failure to communicate good decisions is probably um, the number one cause of failure. So, why does this matter? What is the payoff? When we consider different perspectives, we enlarge our angle of vision. When we involve others, we build invaluable support, even among those who disagree with us. When we take time to see different values and interests at play, we're less likely to overlook something that really matters to us or to others. When we lead with our top value, what matters most to us, and use it, our decision has a force and staying power not otherwise possible. It lasts, it endures. When we communicate openly and honestly to those affected, we won't, through our silence, squander an otherwise good and effective decision. Five minutes. Done. You know, I used to use values, not uh -huh. to talk about meaning. Because it seems to me that, uh, or I'm curious about this, because we know, of course, that people construct meaning, right? Like mm -hmm. you were saying, it's, Absolutely. It's, it's a fundamental need mm -hmm. we have to, mm -hmm. to, to find meaning. And so I was wondering to what extent the kind of disc or the kind of process you describe is actually fundamental in people constructing a meaning 
that may not necessarily only reflect their values, but that simply provides them some kind of coherence. Okay? Right. Because meaning is, of course, something that we ascribe to things that seem coherent to us. So to what extent is there actually a difference? To get to your first question, why not values, at least in the US, um, the term values has become a very loaded political um, <coughs> term. And um, we don't have time to deconstruct that oftentimes in a, me in a meeting. Second, people who are more classically trained in bioethics, <clears throat> think that um, values um, requires that they um, remain in a certain domain of things that matter. And initially, um, we want to get away from that. Uh, when we're dealing with people <coughs> who are facing decisions, um, it's important to find out what really matters to them. And it might be the sort of thing uh, that we would not think really belongs in the category of moral values, but looking for drivers for decisions that are really important to people and that in fact are going to drive their decisions whether they speak them or not. We want to invite that to come out and um, find its proper place. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have ver a very good example. How are we doing? Yeah, we're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> but give the example. And I'll give the yeah. example. Um, words like, for example, the word safety. Um, in Albuquerque, there was a big issue about whether school security should have guns or not. And uh, we did a survey of the citizens of Albuquerque. And it was um, rewarding because everybody said <coughs> the value, <coughs> excuse me, that for them was most important was safety. And um, um, we thought that's good. And then when we dug deeper, of course, we found out what safety meant to people. And of course, 50% thought that they wanted guns on the school guards, and the others didn't want guns within five miles. Um, so a, a behavior, a, a technique that we use is whenever any of us says a word, whether it is a more formal value word, we say, and by that, I mean. And that is a way to bridge uh, sort of interlinguistic, interconceptual worlds. So whenever we say a word uh, that may be a little abstract, we simply follow it with, and by that word in this situation, what I mean is, and we can invite others to do the same. Okay. Thank you.